Did you know that God and Satan know you personally? Totally great and totally scary, right? Today we're going to look into the amazingly graphic story of Job, and they both knew him too. Welcome to The Shepherd's Call with Christian Berdahl. Shepherd's Call Ministry is dedicated to sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ and the three angels' messages, calling to the hearts of God's people through sacred music, challenging messages, and Christian media production. In this series, you will discover practical Bible-based teachings for everyday living. Listen for The Shepherd's Call in today's message, God Doesn't Waste Our Pain, Part 1. Just when I need Him, Jesus is near. Just when I falter, just when I fear. Ready to help me, ready to cheer. Just when I need Him most. Just when I need Him, Jesus is true, never forsaking all the way through, giving for burdens, pleasures anew, just when I need Him most, just when I need Him most, just when I need Him most. Jesus is near to comfort and cheer just when I need Him most. Hello friends, thank you for joining us. Today's message is entitled, God Doesn't Waste Our Pain, and this will be the first part of three. Before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we ask that you would please be with us as we, we dive into your word and an amazing story of a man that had major challenges and trials. We ask that you would teach us things that we haven't perhaps seen before. We ask for the Holy Spirit to guide us now. In Jesus' name, amen. God doesn't waste our pain. Interesting title. And as we go through our message today, hopefully it'll make more sense to you. But I have a question, a couple of questions before we begin. Are you going through trials and tribulations right now? Do you think that maybe your current situation is unfair and you're bitter or angry because of your lot in life? Do you think that God is against you or that your problems are beneath His notice? Some people struggle with these questions. Or have you ever asked, why does it seem like God is so far away? Or do you think that God caused your problems. Friends, Satan is doing everything he can in his hellish power to deceive us regarding God's true character and his special affection for us. The devil seeks to discourage us, to beat us down, to make us run from God, to even blame God for our problems that the devil himself caused. He wants us to live for self to even question the value of a Christian life, to look upon God as a harsh, ruling dictator, or maybe we bought the, into the lie that we're liberated from God and His exacting government. Or perhaps the opposite idea has filled our minds, that maybe we're so filled with shame and regret that we have bought the lie that God has cast us aside. We're no longer His children. Friends, God is not the source of our problems. Satan is. 1 Peter 5.8 is very clear about this. 1 Peter 5.8 reads, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, not a little kitten, as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Now, when we think about lions, do they usually attack the healthy, strong animals in a pack? No, they usually attack the sick or the young, or straggling, or straying animals. They choose victims who are not alone, excuse me, who are alone, or they're not alert, they're not seeing what's going on. Well, P 
Peter warns us to watch out for Satan when we are suffering or we are persecuted or we're separated from the flock because the devil loves to come in and take out the helpless. And friends, when we're feeling alone, weak or helpless and cut off from other believers, so focused on our troubles that we forget to watch out for danger, that roaring lion, this is when we are especially vulnerable to Satan's attacks. Let's look at Ephesians 6, 10 to 11. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. Now that's the key. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may, able, may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So, what I've discovered is that there's a deep-seated belief in Christendom today that's as old as the devil himself. And it goes like this. If we as Christians are suffering, having problems, or going through trials, it's because we are suffering judgment from God. In other words, we've done something wrong and God's spanking us. Well, that we've done something wrong and we're getting punished for it. That there must have been some hidden sin in our lives. There must be something going on that everybody doesn't know. Friends, this is not always the case. Yes, it's true that our own poor choices can give our loving God an opportunity to correct us and help us. And He does this through allowing trials Yes, this is how it works. The way He corrects us and helps us is through allowing trials to come to us many different times in our lives. God will, through His providential hand, actually set up sometimes circumstances to help guide us back to a healthy, life-giving connection with Him. But God doesn't cause the temptation or the trial. He indeed may test us or allow the devil even to afflict us. But God doesn't tempt us. When a test is presented in our lives, this is when the devil jumps in and he tempts us to fall. For example, in the Garden of Eden, there was a test set forth by God, right? Yes, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, was this a temptation placed by God? No, no, no. In fact, let's look at James 1, uh, 13, just to clear this up. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. Amen? Pretty clear right there. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. I'm thankful for that. You see, God didn't tempt Adam and Eve. It was a test. Well, what's the difference, you may ask? Well, let's think about it. It wasn't a temptation for God to place one more tree in the garden where every need and desire for man was already provided for. It was a simple test of obedience. Look. Adam and Eve, you can have everything that I have created. You can have everything else. Just don't eat of this one little tree. So in other words, it is a test, right? Now, what's the difference compared to a test and a trial? If God would have placed them in a different setting where there wasn't any food, for example, and then told them, now, you see that tree over there with all that wonderful food on it? Don't eat it. Even when you get hungry, don't eat of it. You see, that would have been a temptation. That would have just been like playing with them. They would have been tempted to disobey because of their hunger. But God had provided everything for them. Therefore, it was just a test. Everything from our loving God had been provided. Everything that they would have ever needed or even thought that they might even need was provided. And unfortunately, we all know the history of what happened. Our great-grandparents were going about their life totally satisfied and fulfilled. And Eve disobeyed God and wandered away from Adam's side and found herself at the testing tree. Lo and behold, guess who was there? Here's a lesson, friends. The devil was where God said not to go. Amen? And when we go where God says not to go, the devil is always ready and waiting for us. You see, what I love about this story is actually, when you look into it and study into it, God didn't allow the devil to constantly just follow them around, tempting them day after day after day to disobey God. No, 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 no. He was where God had already told them not to go. There's a big lesson there, friends. If God says don't, and we do, we are exposing ourselves. Unfortunately, great-grandma begins to fail the test. Now, she could have stopped. And she could have ran from the temptation in the strength that's only found in their, in their beautiful Creator, God, Jesus Christ. But she chose to stay and she engaged with the devil. So far, 
at this point, there would only have been a test, but now that she stayed on the devil's ground where God said not to go, there's now a temptation. There's not even a trial yet. The trial came. You see, she gave in. She ate of that forbidden fruit. Guess what came next? Of course, the trial. So when sometimes we disobey, the trials do come, of course. So it is with us. God gives us direction. And when we sometimes disregard His counsel or His commands, we, and we go where we shouldn't, and more times than not, the devil is already right there ready to tempt us to fall, then if we choose to fall into the temptation, the trials definitely come because of the consequences of our decisions. And we'll get into that a little bit deeper. The trial, frankly, is us overcoming the selfish decision that we made and come back to God for a closer walk with Him. In fact, let's look at in Heavenly Places 273. Everyone has undiscovered traits of character that must come to light through a life that has no problems. No, that's not what it says. It says everyone has undiscovered traits of character that must come to light through trial. I don't like that. God allows those who are self-sufficient to be sorely tempted that they may understand their helplessness. So he suffers or he permits the deep waters of affliction to go over their souls in order that we may know him and Jesus Christ whom he has sent in order that we may have deep heart longings to be cleansed from defilement and may come forth from the trial purer, holier, happier. Isn't that beautiful? So the reason the trials are here are to grow us to where we come forth more pure, holier, and happier. Satan knows, sometimes we forget, but Satan knows that every trial and every episode of suffering that he inflicts to cause us to stumble can, if we're connected to Jesus, be used by God, listen, as a means of bringing us closer to God. Isn't that awesome? So in other words, even the devil messing with us, if we're surrendered, God can use that and we beat Satan down one more time. In other words, Satan is a beaten foe. Indeed, he was beaten at the cross. But now, by God's grace, he can be beaten out of our lives. Amen. Without God, think about this, life would be just constant, meaningless suffering and toil because of the devil's hatred toward us. So if we didn't have God on our side and we had all the stuff that's going on in our lives, it's just meaningless. It's just suffering for no reason. But there is a reason in it. We learned so we can come forth from the trial more pure, holy, and happy and more consecrated to God. I hope this was making sense. Just remember, the devil hates us. But God doesn't waste our pain. So no matter what we go through, he'll use the assaults of the devil and turn them into productive character development. That is amazing. He'll turn them into success by bringing us closer to Jesus. I'm thankful for the process. I don't love the process. I don't like the trials, but I am embracing the process. If we're going to be grown up Christians, it's time that we just accept the fact that we are going to have trials instead of whining and complaining about it. But don't lose hope. The Bible promise in 1 Corinthians 10, 13 is awesome. It says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will, with the temptation, also make a way of escape. Why? How, why, why the escape? So you may be able to bear it. So what God is saying here is, I am not going to allow one thing to come to you that you can't handle. Really? Well, then no matter what we're going through, God has already measured it and He's allowed it for our benefit. Exactly. You know, I discovered a while back <laughs> that I was praying two prayers that were actually absolutely opposite of one another. Kind of an interesting challenge for the Lord, right? I would pray, Lord, please, prepare me, prepare me for heaven and help me to overcome whatever doesn't please you. I want to even be among the 144,000. And then I would find myself in the middle of a great trial and I cry out, Oh Lord, why is this happening to me? Please take this trial away. <laughs> you see the problem with this? 
I didn't understand how trials and temps, uh, tests and temptations work. You see, I was asking God to help me overcome different character defects, and so God was being faithful as He is to continue the work in me that He had already begun in me. And He was allowing specific trials to come into my life to help me with some specific problems and character defects. So when I would pray, please take this trial away right now, the Lord was saying to me, now Christian, which prayer do you want me to answer? Do you want me to help you overcome or to take away the trial that will help you overcome because you don't want to go through the process right now? Well, friends, we have to get to the place where we just accept that there will be trials. We need to stop whining and complaining, and I would do that. I'd pray, Lord, please draw me closer to you and help me to be one of the 144,000 that ultimately totally overcomes. And then I'd say, but take the trial away. God's going, which one do I answer? Of course, God wants to answer the one that says, I'm going to surrender to you, and Father, I just want to please you. You see, there's a God that loves us and wants to help us to heaven, and there's a devil that hates us, and he wants to lead us to an eternal separation from God, hell. Let's look at James 1, 12 and 13. Blessed is the man that, what, endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life. So notice here, blessed is the man that endures temptation. That means we're going to have to go forward and say, all right, Lord, I, I want to endure the temptation. So in other words, it's going to be a process here of enduring, and I might need some Holy Spirit endurance. Amen? So, blessed man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried. It doesn't say maybe if he's going to be tried. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that loveth him. What a beautiful promise. So in other words, when it comes to trials, there are few men that have even come close to trials in the Bible like Job faced. So, in other words, if we're, if we're staying with the Lord and we're connected with the Lord, then we are promised that we can get through them. And Job understood this. When we think about the trials in the Bible, there are few that even come close, like I said, to the trials that Job faced. So, turn with me, if you have your Bibles, to the book of Job. Now, the history of Job will give us great insight as to one of the deeper reasons why there's so much misery, pain, and suffering among God's people. So let's look at Job 1, 1 to 8. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil, and there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 she-asses and a very great household. So that this man was the greatest of all the men in the east. He was very wealthy. And his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one his day, and sent and he called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and he offered uh, burnt offerings according to the number of all of them. For Job said, it may, might be, that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From the going, from going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. In other words, as a roaring lion, right? And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth? a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Now, this is very interesting. I want to pause for just a second. There's a lesson that we each can learn already from this, and that is, here's God talking about Job. God knows us personally and intimately. That's a beautiful thought. God already knows us, and He already knows us personally and intimately. And here He is talking to Satan about one of His children. Reading on. 
Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? <laughs> he says, Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power, only upon himself put not forth thy hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. So Satan, the accuser of the brethren, was accusing God in heaven of treating Job too good, and accusing Job that he only loved and worshipped God because God had made it so good for him. Now, did Job know about this meeting? Of course not. Did he know that heavenly beings were actually talking about him? Did he know that God himself called him by his name and was talking about him? Of course not. He didn't know all of this. And as I read this, I go, man, it kind of sounds like God's wanting to mess with Job. Almost like, okay, go for it. And like, almost like, let's just put that little mouse out there between the cats and the cat's going to, who, who gets the, the mouse first? But no. The Lord declares in Jeremiah 29, 11, something very important for us to consider. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. You see, what God wants to do is to give us an expected end, and that is, of course, success and power and overcoming in our lives when we are connected to Jesus Christ. Make sense? So, reading the story of Job, we're going to learn many different things. And we'll learn that Job was a man of faith. He was a godly man, as we would call him, a multimillionaire that was well-liked and looked up to in, in his um, community. He was a judge, a councilman. He was actually very sought after as a very wise counselor. He was a family man, and his wife and his children loved him. His neighbors loved him, and he actually turned his face against evil things. And You can find all of this in, in the commentary there in the Word of God. He offered prayers and sacrifice for his family, which we already read. He never engaged in adultery. He helped the poor, the sick, and the fatherless. He lightened the widow's heart, and he helped the blind and the lame. People in the community had the utmost respect and love and honor for this amazing, wonderful man of God. As Job went about his noble life, Satan was planning his ruin. Now, Satan must have sat back and thought, what would really hurt Job? Because we know that the devil wouldn't have just given him a little temptation. He wanted to prove God wrong. This was about the great controversy between Satan and God. What would bring him down? Down so far that he would even curse God. I know. I'll steal his wealth. I'll kill his children. And then all of his friends, even his family, will accuse him of being sinful and evil. In fact, I'll even have people come and counsel with him to turn away from his evil ways when in reality he's an upright man. This will cause him to feel far away from his God and forsaken by his God. This will drive him crazy. This will drive him mad. I will cause all to look upon him with contempt. I will ruin his good reputation. Yes, I'll even cause some of the calamities with miracles. So it will look like they came from God himself. This is bound to work. He cavorts. Friends, Satan does the same thing with us. And in Job 1, 13 to 19, we can pick up the story again. And there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen, the oxen were plowing and the asses were feeding beside them. And the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. And while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God has fallen from heaven and has burnt up the sheep and all the servants and has consumed them. And I only am escaped alone to tell you. And while yet he was speaking, another also came and said, The Chaldeans, they came out of three bands 
and they fell upon the camels, and they have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I am only alone to escape to tell thee. And while he was yet speaking, another came in, another, and said, Thy sons and thy daughters. And Job must have been like, No, no, my, your sons and your daughters were, were drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house and it fell upon the young men and they are dead. And I am only escaped alone to tell thee. Did Job know why all this was happening? No. The poor brother's just going along in his life and all of a sudden, Everything breaks loose on him. He loses all of his wealth immediately, and all ten of his children are killed. And report, 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 report. Bam, 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 bam. I mean, talk about a left and a right and an upper hook. The devil was trying to take him out. Did, did he know who was behind all of this terror? Well, no. Obviously, Job didn't have all the facts, did he? All he knew was what he could see and what he was hearing in the reports. So let's look at the four calamities real quick. People came and stole oxen and asses and killed his servants. That's bad. Second calamity, fire came down from heaven, fire came down from heaven and killed his sheep and his servants. The third calamity, people again stole camels and killed his servants. And now at this point, all of his wealth is gone. And then he gets the worst report of all wind or like a tornado smote your children's house, the corners fell in and it killed all of your children. This was an all out planned attack from the devil. And to think that the devil's not strategic, it would be foolish. We would be remiss to think that the devil just goes, I don't know, let's just do something today. He is strategic and he's planning not only Job's destruction, but he's planning ours. Now, my question is, did God do this? No, he didn't. Did God allow this? Yes, he did. Did Job know this? No, he didn't. Did Job like this? Of course not. It broke his heart. At this point, did Satan tempt him? Yes. The lesson we can learn here, let's look at our second lesson. When things fall apart, and there's no apparent reason for it, and we have been living a healthy Christian life, then we must conclude that there is more to the picture, that we don't have all the facts. Amen? So when we look at the four, the first one, uh, Job could resign it to misfortune and man's sinfulness because the people came and stole part of his wealth. The second one, however, is a little bit different, quite supernatural in its manifestation. Fire came down from heaven and it, it, it took out 7,000 sheep. So I wonder if Job starts to have some confusion here. Okay, it's not just sinful man. We actually have supernatural things coming. I wonder if this is God. Third, man again. Yep, the guys come in. It looks orchestrated because we have people coming from different sides and taking the rest of his wealth. But the fourth one is another supernatural event, or as we would call it, an act of nature, or some people call it an act of God. Something was really wrong here. What are the odds of all of my stuff being taken and then a tornado hitting only my kid's house and killing them? Something is going on. Job mourns this great loss. And in the middle of this great loss, in the middle of all of his confusion, the Bible records something amazing. Job 1, 20 to 22. Then Job arose after he gets all of this bad news he rents his mantle, shaves his head, and he fell down upon the ground and worshiped. And he said, Naked I came out of my mother's womb, and naked I shall return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all of this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. That, my friends, is amazing. This is a man of obviously great faith. And he obviously had a genuine walk with the Lord. You see, he had developed a, a knowledge of God. He had developed a, an experience with God, a deep experience with God, apparently, because God allowed him to go through some major tests. God didn't allow this huge trial to come to Job at the beginning of his walk with God. 
you understand that, right? When it comes to trial, I think of character growth. When I think of, excuse me, when I think of trial and character growth, I think of like weight training. We, we would never start doing bench presses with a huge weight, right? Well, no, we start with less weight. And as our muscles strengthen because of the strain that we're putting on them, then the muscles grow and they're able to handle more weight. This is the process of building muscle. So God would not have placed too heavy a trial in our lives if our faith muscle was not yet strong enough to help to handle it. So when we come to Christ and we say, Lord, I'm surrendering my life to you, then we can know that God will not place us in any sort of trial that would be bigger than our faith. Make sense? The trials and lessons will continue and most likely they're going to increase and God is using the trials of life to help us to trust and rely on Him. You see, He's growing us. He's building our, our faith muscle. Why? To prepare us for the heavy weight, the great trial at the end of time, the greatest weight ever that we're going to be going through. By the way, the Bible is very clear that we're going to be going through a major trial. Let's look at Matthew 24, 21. For then shall be great tribulation, that means oppression, affliction, trouble, and distress, such as was not since the what? The beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. So amazingly enough, God's saying, nothing has even hit this planet like what's going to hit at the end. And if we haven't accepted the experience of God's guiding hand now and learn to cooperate with Him now in our lives, allowing His providence to be exercised in our life, His deliverance from the trials that we now face, for example, then we will, never be, we will be deceived in the last days. We will never get through it. Matthew 24, 24 says, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. If it were possible, the very elect can be deceived? Yes. So, we have an opportunity. We must grow into an experience where we hear Jesus' voice, the voice of the true shepherd calling to our hearts. Amen? Recognize and following is leading in our lives. If we have experienced this, then we will never be deceived. We will never be deceived by another voice calling to us. And so the only way that we're going to make it through life as real Christians is to look to Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. So we need to stay connected to Him through prayer, through reading His Word, and stepping out in faith to meet life's challenges, believing that He will continue to work the change in our hearts that is so needed, like it talks about in Hebrews 12, 2. We need to come to Him by faith and believe and put our trust in Him that He will finish what He's begun in us because we all have faith according to Romans 2, uh, 12, 3. You see, God doesn't ask us to go through more than our little faith can endure or maybe our medium faith or maybe our big faith. He'll always measure it. In fact, it's our privilege to eventually grow to a place where we, as it says in James 1, 2, and 3, Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Now, that's crazy amazing. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Now, what is patience? Well, the Greek word is hupomene, which means steadfastness, consistency, and endurance. So in other words, going through these trials, being connected to Jesus, learning these things, we will learn, like it is in the New Testament, that, that hupomene is a characteristic of a man who is not swerved from his deliberate purpose to what? To bring honor and glory to God. He is not swerved from his loyalty to faith and piety, even by the greatest trials and sufferings. James 1.4, I love this, but let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. So God has an amazing plan for us. And he says in James 1.12 and 13, blessed, and we read this earlier, blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. 
Amen? Neither tempteth God any man. So Job's life and his spiritual walk, if you read the story, is now at a critical point. He didn't know why all this was happening. And so what he had to do was to go by faith, not by sight. He had to put his trust in God, right? He had to walk by faith, like it says in 2 Corinthians 5.17. So this very elect, Job, was nearly deceived by what he saw and by the emotions that were coursing through him. He lost all of his wealth. Even worse, he lost all of his children. Now, in Mark 9, bear with me for just a moment. In Mark 9, there's a story about a father who cries out to Jesus to deliver his son from torment. Let's look at it. Mark 9, 23 and 24. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. Sometimes, friends, just like Job and this father, we are brought into situations and circumstances that we feel like God has left us. It doesn't feel like He's helping us or delivering us, but we have been in His Word and we know that He is with us. We understand that intellectually and we have seen Him help us in the past if we've had a genuine relationship with, us, with Him. And He's, he's gotten us through and, and pulled us through and navigated us through different challenges in our lives. So we know that He's there for us and we know He has allowed this trial to come and He will make a way of escape for us because we understand the Scriptures, but it doesn't feel like it. Can you relate? <laughs> I can relate to that. So we must be careful not to let our emotions or even what we see to cause us to lose hope and faith in whom we believe. We got to be careful. We must walk by faith, believing, even though we say, help my unbelief. In other words, I believe with what I've learned, but it doesn't feel like you're close right now. So the moment that Job, through this massive trial, rent his robe and fell down and worshiped God, Satan's accusations were proven false. You see, Job won the battle in that very moment as he held on to God by faith, not by sight. Because everything around him looked like God had forsaken him, right? Through faith, victory was his. It even looked like some of the stuff may have happened from God. So he, even though he had this victory through faith right here and right now in that moment, did his situation change? No, no, no. He was still going to have to bury his children and he would live as a poor man. But spiritual victory was already his. He had linked with his God and through that, that beautiful, unexplainable miracle of heart communication with God, Job's heart was comforted and encouraged. Now herein lies the difference between a man of faith and a man of the world. You see, the man of faith at the beginning, the middle, and the end of his trial can hope all things and endure all things, while the man lacking faith is easily discouraged. He thinks the worst and he gives up on hope. So the lesson we can learn here is, let's look at our third lesson. When we are tempted or smote with problems, we can immediately gain the victory and peace in the midst of the storm if we run to our Savior, not from Him. Amen? So one of the most powerful and comforting passages that I've ever found in the Bible is found in Isaiah 41, 10 to 13. Let's take a look at that. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Now, here's what I want you to understand. I want you to look at this with me for just a moment. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. So God's saying, I'm with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen thee. I will help thee. I will uphold thee. It sounds like Jesus wants to do a whole bunch for me and for you. Amen? Behold, he says, all they that were incensed against thee shall be ashamed and confounded. They shall be as nothing, and they that strive with thee shall perish. Thou shalt seek them and shall not find them. Even them that contended with thee, they that war against thee, shall be as nothing and as a thing of naught. 
for I the Lord thy God will hold thee hold thy right hand saying unto thee fear not I will help thee so here's God promising I have all of these beautiful things for you I will help you I'll uphold you I will do all these things for you so in other words if we surrender to him then we know that all things will work together for good that love God so let's look at that Romans 8:28 it says, and we know that all things, does that mean our trials? It does. All things work together for good to them that love God. Thank God for that. So in other words, no matter what my trial is, no matter what I'm going through, then we could actually have God with us because He measured it. He allowed it to come to me. And so if I'm with God and I'm learning how to walk with God and surrender my life to Him, then all of a sudden God says, look, I'll do all these things for you. I'll get you through the trial. I'll uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. I will, everything that comes to you, I'll work it out so it's of good for you. That is the God I serve. So friends, when trials come, let's not begrudge it. Let's just say, Lord, please help me through this because I want to bring honor and glory to you. Amen? Now I wish we can continue, my friends but we are already out of time. Time just flies when we're having fun, amen? So we'll have to pick up right where we left off in our next message. So stay tuned, we'll be right back with my beautiful wife, Kobe, for Talk After the Talk. Travel with Christian Bernal as he ministers around the world. Highways and Byways features testimonies, personal stories, and behind the scenes footage of a traveling speaker and singer. Watch as lives are changed as a result of sharing God's word. Visit blog.shepcall.com today. Welcome back. This is my favorite time when my wife joins me. Uh, sweetheart, I'm glad that you're here with me. Yeah, it's good to be here. And this message is something that uh, really digs deep into our hearts because it was... Well, it uh, does. Even um, I was thinking, you know, while you were preaching back to when we first dove into studying about this subject and uh, took me back a little while, but um, it's, it's amazing how far we've come. Amen. And I think that's one of the, the sweet things about knowing when you go through trials that um, there usually is an end. <laughs> exactly. And there's a period of time when you get to come away from it and look back on things, mm -hmm. and then you can see a lot of growth or you can see a lot of purpose in it. Sometimes we're in the middle of it. You can't always see that, but that's where our trust, our trust in the Lord comes in and gets us through. And this particular message, um, you'll probably remember, was uh, wrapped around it was your a traumatic, ear. yeah, my ear, uh, a pretty traumatic event that yeah. was in my life. Uh, what happened was my, uh, I was diagnosed, my ear, my, the hearing in my ear was decreasing over time. And well, and you had lots of pain, lots of problems, and mm -hmm. lots of abnormal noises. Yeah, <laughs> and, and I went to, to five different ear, nose, throat specialists, and nobody diagnosed it correctly until I got to that, was it the fifth or the sixth mm -hmm. one? And finally he says, you have a cholesteatoma, and this is bad, and you need surgery. Which was only because you had went scuba diving with a friend. That's right. And it ruptured. That's right, and I wound up in the hospital the next day, and they were in there vacuuming, and all of a sudden they hit that, that hole. Right. And it was like a slit, and so they couldn't see it just uh, observing it. But as soon as that vacuum hit it, just and I was like, oh, immediate vertigo. Yeah. It was terrible. And um, the reason we were bringing this up is because this obviously is what drove us to start looking into trials. Because when I was diagnosed with that, I went home, you weren't home, you were uh, out doing some grocery shopping and we live in the country so you were like 40 minutes mm -hmm. away. I called you and I was, I had gone home and started looking up cholesteatoma and looking up some of the issues and some of the side effects like uh, in my case they weren't sure it could even lead to brain abscesses, uh, I could already have that, it could have even led to death on the operating room table that had happened facial paralysis, no taste buds, I mean all these terrible things. And within moments I was overwhelmed. Well, and uh, vertigo. Vertigo for life, yeah. all those kinds of things. <laughs> where you just can't even walk, you have to crawl everywhere you go. And so I called you and I was in the middle of that and I was really upset. What do you remember about that? 
I remember because I had stopped off at your mom's house and was visiting with her before I headed back up the hill to come home and that's when you had called and it was um you were you were crying I was I was very <laughs> upset yeah you were very upset mm -hmm. and um just you know kind of in shock you were you were you weren't real clear on everything with me and I couldn't um, get the words out as the yeah problem. you were just you know this is what's wrong and it's serious and I'm gonna have to have surgery and there's lots of risks and and it was just so, I remember my head was just kind of spinning a little bit and I thought I gotta go and get home. And you know, I had a, an hour, a little over an hour drive home and stuff to get up to where you were. And, and what really hit me at that point was I was getting overwhelmed, friends, and I was at a place to where uh, I had let go of the Lord for a little bit there when I was starting to have a little bit of a self-pity party. Right. And not, I wasn't like trying to make myself sad or whatever, but I was definitely not giving it over to God at that moment. Right. And that's what you heard on the phone. Well, yeah, this is a little bit more of just, it was <laughs> overwhelmed and yeah, fear well, yeah. and <laughs> all those things. It yeah. wasn't uh, surrendered and okay, yeah. Lord's got this. Right. That, you know, yeah. that wasn't the, but by the, the immediate time, mindset. But by the time you got home, uh, by the time we got off the phone and you arrived 40 minutes later, um, I remember uh, as you walked in, something really miraculous for me happened. And there's a point to the whole story, by the way. <laughs> what really happened was in that, that 40 minute period of time, I had gotten on my knees and I had surrendered my life back to the Lord. I surrendered that moment to the Lord. And I said, not my will, but your will be done. And there was a peace that came. And I said, Lord, this is not my ear. This is your ear. Mm -hmm. Take it, the hearing from it if you want. Take my life if you want. I'm not even mine. I'm bought with a price. And so uh, by the time you got home, uh, I was in a very different place. Oh, yeah. You're like, it's going to be okay. And you know what? I'm safe in the Lord's hand. And we're going to get through it. And you just were able to... Um, instead of emotionally try to get through the next, you were just able to logically lay out kind of what the next steps were mm -hmm. that we were going to do. And You said I almost had like an eerie piece about me, that it was almost like it was different man than on the phone. But this is in, your, in the message here, one of the things that had come to us at that time in studying out this, because th that was just a moment in time. Correct. The whole thing was months long and there right. were lots of emotions and up and down that happened. And major trials and problems yeah. and issues. And, and so uh, James 1, 2, the scripture, yeah, we could look at that again. Count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptations. I just want to stop there because I think this is something that we say so many times, count it all joy when you're going through terrible things. How? All of a sudden, yay, I've got right. a, this tumor in my ear and I'm going to lose my hearing and maybe die on the operating table. Ha ha, right. I'm happy. You, no, it can't be joy in the way that we sometimes account joy to be. Mm. I think we sometimes want to use joy and happy as synonyms. Exactly. Yes, I agree. And they really have at the core of them a very different tone in mm -hmm. what they mean. Yes. And um, you think about happiness. And actually wrote down some stuff and I just read it because I think it, it says it clearly yeah. instead of me trying to fumble through. Happiness tends to be fleeting and depends on temporal factors like circumstances or other people. Right. So it can be affected by what's going on around us. So if I were to bring you, sorry, I shouldn't no, no, cut you off. Okay. If, if I were to bring you a present or a gift mm -hmm. or make you dinner or rub your, right. your feet or whatever, that might make you, make you feel happy yeah well and many times happiness i think can be that where you you just don't have a care in the world right now there's just this feeling of happiness and it's and fleeting though right blue skies you know everything yeah. is good joy on the other hand is true contentment that comes from internal factors like our faith in the lord so i think mm -hmm. happiness is very dependent on external things and what's happening right. around us and or what so people are doing make you happy or unhappy right where joy is a, a contentment, mm -hmm. a, a peace yes. in the storm, yes. so to say, because of our faith in God, because we trust that no matter what circumstances we're in, He's got us. That's right. And He's not going to let more come to us than we can handle. Amen. And that He already knows the end. 
So if we're with him, he's going to carry us through. And that's where the peace comes, the joy comes. Yes. So count it all joy, not happiness. Right. Because right. there was nothing it's happy not about throw hearing a party about this. Or <laughs> yeah. There yeah. was nothing happy about right. that ear problem. But by the time you got home, I had peace and joy in the Lord, right. knowing everything was going to be okay. Right. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Now, patience can be more accurately translated as endurance. So, in other words, we can count it all joy, not happiness, when we fall into all diverse temptations, trials and tribulations, right? Knowing this, know this, because we've had experience with God, right. that that's going to work for us by our faith and it's going to grow our patience and endurance. So, that means we can get through the trial, which brings joy in knowing God's going to see us through. That's right. different than happiness. It's very different than happiness. And I thought another thought that I had down here was true joy is, etern true joy is eternal because it's based on our relationship with Jesus Christ, who is himself an everlasting source of joy. Amen. That's why it works. That's why it works. And that's why it builds us and yeah. grows us. That's why without him, it, it doesn't. We do not find joy. You don't find that um, contentment to be able to endure, to, to endure, that right. peaceful contentment to endure through the trial if you don't have Christ. Without Him, you're just suffering. You're just getting through it and usually struggling through. And what's the happening. point of it? In fact, it, it becomes almost useless mm -hmm. in a sense if we're not going to learn lessons from it and grow through it and through the trials and have Christ see us through, then it becomes a bunch of useless pain and suffering. Right. But with God, everything that comes to us can be used for our growth or right. somebody else's. Can all serve a purpose. Can all serve. When we come to Him, and that's what we say: God doesn't waste our pain. Exactly. You're going to have struggles yep. in this world, no matter what. We're not free from them because we're Christians. Right. We're still going to have them. There is that idea, though, that that. <laughs> When you become a Christian, all your troubles go away, or it's so hard, much harder as a Christian than it would be in the world. I think, no. I mean, any of us who have been on both sides and know have, that... both of us. Yeah, there's just as many, and anybody can look at the world and see the struggles that people that are Christians and aren't are going through, and they're, they're all there. And you, we all have these struggles. And so when we are with God... He helps those struggles to have a purpose. Absolutely. He brings something good out. We might not see it in the process, but right. we can trust knowing that He does. That's right. Because the Bible says all things work together for good to those, to those who love, who the love Lord. God. That's right. right. So God can bring amazing prosperity, amazing results, amazing growth out of tremendous adversity. Right. In fact, it's almost like in the world, all these trials and tribulations, it almost may be more jaded than anything. <laughs> Not joy-filled, but jaded. Right. So let's get, move on here. Uh, continuing on to read. But let patience or endurance have her perfect work. So when our patience is grown and our endurance is grown, it's going to have that perfect work. Let patience do what it's going to do in your life, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. That's the blessing. Right. When we stick with God and we stay with God, that's where the blessing is. And that, that, that does bring joy. Absolutely. It brings peace knowing God has all the answers. It brings frustration when I'm trying to figure it all out. Right, right, yeah. It's, I mean, you have to think that when, when Job was going through what he was, there was not happiness. He wasn't, yay, my, all my wealth is taken and my kids right. are killed. Um, and it was a very long long process right. from how we read it, that he was struggling and enduring. Right. But there was, you know, There a, was peace. A settled con contentment that he kind of went through, you say, a, a trust. Trust. There was a trust yes. that he, he went through in it because it was, you know, naked I came into this world, naked I'll go out. That's trusting God. Lord, I'm in your hands. That's right. You've given me all of this. You mm -hmm. have the right to take it, you know. And, and that's the right perspective. And I can go through whatever because I trust that you intend this for good in some way for your ultimate plan. Right, because we know God 
doesn't think any evil toward us. He doesn't want bad things for us. He wants the best for us. But there's kind of a rocky road sometimes that we have to go through and, and traverse over before we're going to get to that place of, ah, patience is doing her perfect work to where I'm, I'm really, I'm just going to be surrendered in this. And I think, at least for me, and going through the experience we did with you and your ear and all the emotions that were wrapped up in that and all the uncertainties and all the things we didn't know what was right. going to happen on the other side, it is that trusting, trusting God. It is our faith in Him yes. and in all that He says and in His Word that is going to carry us through. So Amen. if we are not in daily study, mm -hmm. if we're not spending that time to learn about His character, to Christ's character and what He went through and God's intentions towards His people, how are we going to have that when no. we go through it's these trials? It's an impossibility. Right. So that's just a, another key that it all comes down to our relationship and our daily relationship and our daily walk. And even in that, that scenario where I hear the music, I need to go here. Um, even in that scenario that uh, after, uh, right up to the trial, through the trial, and even after the trial, we were able to really surrender it. And it was amazing what God wanted for us through that. We look back now and go, wow, there were a lot of lessons that we learned. And, and I would do it again, honestly. And I think Job would say the same thing. I do it again because I know now my God in a way that I didn't know him before. All right. Well, thank you, sweetheart, for joining me. Just when I need him, Jesus is strong, bearing my burden all the day long for all my sorrow giving a song just when I need him most just when I need him he is my all answering when upon him I call Tenderly watching, lest I should fall, just when I need Him most. Just when I need Him most, just when I need Him most. Jesus is near to comfort and cheer, just when I need Him. Friends, we want to thank you for your prayers, encouraging letters, and the financial support that you send each month. Without you partnering with us, we would not be able to fulfill the work that God has laid before us. We pray that you have been blessed by Christian's message today. And if you would like to receive your own copy, simply contact us at shepherdscall.com or phone us at 505-286-5522. Until next time, May your heart stay open to the Shepherd's Call.